In this video, what we're going to do is see how we can make objects appear like they're floating in space, slowly rotating. It could be molecules, it could be any other objects. I use this technique a lot with my medical animations, and I do get comments from time to time asking for me to do more of these types of videos. So I figured this might be a good example to make one out of. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so I already showed the example in the intro, but I did want to quickly go over how I created this geometry for anybody who's interested. Um, I took a sphere that I set the type to icosahedron um, and then cloned smaller spheres onto the points of our original sphere. Then dropped that into a volume builder where I smoothed things out and then meshed it. And then I ended up remeshing it to get the polygon count lower. Um, sometimes if I want more detail in the actual geometry, what I will do is then drop it into a displacer with a subdivision surface um, on that um, smoothing the end result. Now I could also do that with a redshift um, object tag, although I don't have redshift set up as the render in the scene. And that would be a way to subdivide it at render time, though you could also just kind of set that to zero. So our subdivisions in our viewport don't show and that allows me to take this even further. Um, but with that in mind, we're going to work with the simple version. And there's a few different techniques I use to make objects float, depending on how many of them, depending on what exactly I'm trying to do. And so that's what we're going to be going over, um, starting with the simplest way of doing this, which is with the vibrate tag. Now, there's nothing wrong with using the vibrate tag for this, um, but I find it works best when I want to use or um, can get away with using fewer objects. So maybe just a handful. Uh, if I have more objects than this, it can get a bit tricky um, to manage them, especially if I need to change the settings. Now I've done a video about the vibrate tag before. Um, essentially we want to enable position and then set some nice values on the X, Y, and Z. So X, Y, and Z. A big part of getting something to look like it's floating is how much it's moving and the speed. And what we'll typically see, whether we're using the vibrate tag or MoGraph to do this, is that um, there's a balance between kind of the amount of movement and the speed. And if you increase the amount, or in this case, the amplitude, it's then going to make it move quicker. So if I reduce the speed here to say something like 0.3, we can see this is now moving pretty slowly. But if I increase the amount here to say 500, well, now it's moving more. And so in order to slow this down, I would need to lower the frequency. Okay, so it's a balancing act between the amount of movement, in this case amplitude, versus the speed, in this case frequency. And I can do the same thing with rotation. I'm going to start by setting this to about the same frequency that we used for our movement. That tends to work pretty well. And then I can increase the rotation to say... 180. If I think that's too much, maybe I can even lower that. All right. And we essentially now have a nice kind of floating object here. The problem we can run into though is with multiple objects. Now I can very easily switch this to world transform here, duplicate these out. Um, but if I'm not careful, um, they'll all end up having the same movement. Okay. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. Now, the way to fix that is by using different seed values in all of the different tags. Now, if you have a bunch of different tags, the way to cheat this is just to come in here and do num plus one. A little simple expression where Cinema 40 looks at the number of objects you have selected, what order it is, what number that is in that order, and then just adds one to it. So our first tag will be z uh, one because it starts at zero. We added one and then two, three, four, and five. So now we essentially have these objects um, slowly floating. And like I said, I like this technique um, because it's pretty quick and simple and it works when I only have a few objects. So a handful like this. When I have more than that, um, that's when I'll start to use a MoGraph for doing something like this. Now, same piece of geometry, I'm gonna put it into a cloner and I will then just kind of space these out a decent amount, you know, kind of framing my view with this. All right, maybe something like this. Taking a look at it from the side, probably want a little bit more distance there, right? Something like this. And at this point, it is gonna look like a pretty regular grid and that's okay because we're going to add some variation to the position here using a random effector. So 
that's what I'll do with my cloner selected, choose random. And this one's gonna be just for position. So we'll just say random position, move it into our null here and stay organized. Um, and with this one, I'm just looking to kind of break up the grid. Okay, so something like maybe that works. Um, I can also do rotation as well. Not that it's terribly noticeable. These all have the same rotation, but it can't hurt. And you could also do scale to try and fake some perspective here. So uniform scale. So this is gonna make some objects look a little bit closer, a little bit further away, or just add more variation depending on what you want. And so, yeah, this is more than just position. So I could just add, um, you know, scalar rotation into the name of this. So I know exactly what it's doing. Essentially, this is not for animation. That's the, the most important part here. Uh, now with my cloner selected, I'm gonna create another random effector. And this one will be for animation. Okay, so I will type anim. And with this, I do want a, enough movement, right? So that these can move freely. Same with rotation, All right? And move a decent amount back in the effector tab is where we create our animation with this. And we choose noise, or you could choose turbulence as well. Both are animated. Um, I personally like noise a little bit better. And you can see, yeah, we're getting some real crazy movement. Once again, we need to adjust the speed. Okay. Um, and just like previously, the amplitude is essentially what we're doing in the parameter tab here. So the speed looks pretty good. Remember, it's kind of a balancing act between um, what values I have set up uh, in terms of how much I'm telling this to move or rotate. So this looks pretty good from a rotation point of view. I may want a little bit more movement. And there have been times where I've actually even separated out the position animation from the rotation animation, uh, since I may want two very different speeds and that can be hard to do. The only other thing I'll, I'll sometimes do in here is check the scale because I find giving this a larger value, something like 500% tends to make the animation um, a little bit smoother from uh, clone to clone or, or molecule to molecule in this case, whatever, uh, or however you want to think about it. So this technique I really, really like for kind of background elements. Um, the one downside to this technique is that I can't get it to loop. Okay. And sometimes that doesn't matter if it does, or if I'm using a really long animation and just want to be able to add this background to it, then looping does matter. And so the way I would do that is going to be a bit different. I'm going to uncheck random animation and um, this time create a plane effector for our cloner. Okay. And I'm still going to need to add some values here really about the same as I had in my random animation. So about 290 ish for each of those will be roughly what I go with there. So something like this I can check rotation on as well. Do the same thing. All right, and when I hit play, I'm not gonna have any animation because I'm gonna create this animation using a field instead of the effector itself. And the field I'm going to go with is in fact a random field. Okay, now just adding it doesn't give me any animation. Instead, I want to increase the animation speed here. Okay, and you can see maybe I need to go a little bit higher than what I had in my random effector. And so that's looking pretty good, but the key here is this loop period where I can specify when I want it to loop. So we now have this looping animation, though the loop is a bit strange. It's almost like it's going back and forth. Um, that could be just the values we're using. It could be the noise pattern. So we could try changing this and seeing if we get something a little bit better, although now we're not getting any looping. Um, so that's really interesting that it's not working like I would expect. Okay, but yes, if I need looping, this is the approach I would use. Another consideration aside from looping would be if these objects are intersecting. Now these obviously aren't, I've done a pretty good job avoiding that. And usually that is something that's easy to do. Uh, there are times, however, when I'm using a bunch of objects and there's just no way of um, avoiding intersection with this random movement. And I'm gonna switch back to the random um, effector animation here because um, the 
the technique I'm about to show you isn't really going to work with this to make it loop. Okay, so back to the, the unlooping version we go. Maybe we increase this so we don't have to, our um, frame range here, so we don't have to watch it loop quite as much. There we go. And what we're going to do is use dynamics. Now, before we dive in and use dynamics on this, I definitely want to make sure I get some intersecting so that we can kind of see uh, that we will not get any intersecting once we add in dynamics. So let's just do this and start bringing these kind of closer together. I may also need to reduce the random position a bit as well here. That could be, or actually maybe even increasing it so we get some intersection. All right, I think I have a few places where these are intersecting. Okay, yeah, right there. So yeah, we can use dynamics to very quickly get around this issue. And, and this dynamics technique would also work with the vibrate tag. So um, what I'm gonna do is on my cloner, I'm going to right click, go to bullet tags and choose the rigid body tag. Um, now the important part here um, is going to be in that force tab because if we just hit play, you can see things kind of just explode if they're intersecting another piece of geometry uh, and then fall because they have gravity applied. So what we want to do is come in here to the follow position and set a value of 10, which is pretty high. You'll see a little bit of kind of movement in the beginning while things separate, but now we will not have to worry about these objects intersecting at all. They may stay close together. I've noticed that, but they will not intersect. And if you wanted to get rid of that little kind of initial separation, why? That is exactly why um, we can set an initial state. So let's see, where did they put that? Dynamics, there it is, set initial state. So something like this, set initial state. I go back to frame zero. That's what it looks like now. These objects have already separated for the most part. It's still a bit there, um, which is a bit concerning. But, you know, I could just start rendering this after, say, frame 10, and I would be good to go. So it's not the end of the world there. And if you're going, well, this is all well and good, um, you know, there's also times I will use the vibrate tag example so that uh, I can very easily kind of create a hero molecule. Um, the one I want to be in focus, the one I want to make sure, you know, is front and center here uh, with the background one doing, the background ones doing everything else like we just saw. And so this is kind of the, I mean, that's essentially the setup I used here. I have the vibrate tag one for my hero um, kind of molecule, MoGraph for the others. Uh, the the plane effector here really isn't doing anything other than giving color. And um, I didn't actually end up using it because as you can see, it changes. Um, but that's essentially the end result. I'll break down the scene a little bit more just for anybody curious. Um, I am using some dust particles from Grayscale Gorilla um, from uh, their subscription. So it comes with some of the assets you can download. So that's kind of what's giving this the particular look here. You could very easily do that with a particle system or you really would be better off doing it in After Effects, but just for the um, overall look, I thought it would make sense here. I do have depth of field um, turned on. So in the optical section of my camera, I do have it turned on. I did set the focus distance and I'm using a really, really low um, aperture here uh, because of uh, the scene scale, which ended up uh, quite large. I do have an environment in here kind of casting um, the light, which is why we're seeing kind of the shadows. Uh, environments are a bit tricky to set up. Definitely a lot of back and forth between the scattering, attenuation, uh, along with um, the weight of the, the amount of contribution from your light. And so uh, don't plan on going into that in this video, but perhaps a different video. And that's essentially um, everything that I did in order to create the floating animation um, that we saw at the beginning. So I'll show this one more time just so you can kind of see the end result. But yeah, like I said, I use this technique a bunch. It's, gr it's great and um, it really helps create some interesting backgrounds for uh, a lot of the medical animations I do. That will do it for this video. If there's anything else you would like to see, please let me know down in the comments below. If you could also like this video and subscribe if you learned something, I'd appreciate that as well. And until next time, 
Take care.